Good morning. In this video, I want to try something different. I want to take you foraging in my backyard. Most people think that harvesting wild edibles is a cumbersome process, one that gets you in your car, forces you to drive very far away, and requires a lot of time and effort. And in this video, I want to disprove that and show you that it's as easy as going into your yard and collecting some plants. I would argue it's even more convenient than going to the grocery store because like I already mentioned, all you have to do is walk out your front door and boom, it's abundant with things that you can eat. There's nothing special about my backyard. My backyard is perhaps like the most run of the mill typical backyard that exists. I didn't plant any specific wild edibles there. The only thing I did was I let my weeds grow. I didn't trim them, I didn't cut my lawn and that's what you're gonna see today. I'm confident that regardless of where you live, whether it's in Europe or North America or South America, if you go into your own backyard, you'll be able to find at least a, a couple of the plants that we discussed today in your nick of the woods. If you're just sitting on the couch right now with some time to kill watching this video, I might make a suggestion. I recommend that you take this video to your mobile device like your phone or your tablet, go outside in your own front yard or backyard and forage along with me. It's sort of like a virtual wild edibles tour that doesn't require you to go very far. I've traveled around the globe extensively. I've been to over 66 countries. I've been to every single state in the United States. And my experience has taught me that there's a huge overlap in the wild edibles sector. So dandelions, for example, grow in every single country that I've been to. It doesn't matter if you're in Southeast Asia, or in North America, there's generally some type of dandelion growing, and I can personally attest to this. The human species isn't the only species that likes to travel. Wild plants like to travel too, and they accomplish this by spreading their seeds in the wind. So that same dandelion, for example, can throw its seeds in the wind, and eventually, over time, those seeds can travel thousands of miles and end up in places where dandelions have no business being, or maybe they do. Another way that plants travel is through animals. So if a bird lands on a specific plant, eats some of its seeds, then makes its voyage somewhere else for the winter and poops out those seeds, guess what? That plant is gonna be growing in a different location. So who am I and why the heck am I credible to talk about this? Wild edibles are often a controversial subject. We all remember the story of the guy in Into the Wild. He went out, he was unprepared, he ate stuff he wasn't supposed to, and it didn't work out so well for him. To that I say, I'm credible to talk about this subject because I'm a guy on the internet with a camera. No, I'm just kidding. I actually know what I'm talking about. I've been studying wild plants for over 20 years. I'm 33 years old right now, and I started very young when I was just 13. Uh, and I haven't, you know, I haven't just been like casually researching the subject. I've been very thorough about it. It's something that I'm very interested in and so I do my due diligence and I study plants meticulously and I also test everything on myself before I recommend it to others. Along the way I've published a book. This is a very good book. This is also a shameless plug of my very good book. It's called Wild Edibles, A Practical Guide to Foraging with Easy Identification of 60 Edible Plants and 67 Recipes. It's available everywhere, Amazon, bookstores, you name it. And it's a very good book. It's a great way to start foraging. What sets me apart from other foragers is I come at wild edibles from a nutritional standpoint. And as far as I can tell, I might be one of the first people to recommend blending wild edibles in green smoothies. So that's kind of my niche because a lot of wild edibles tend to be bitter to the taste but you can mask that bitterness by blending them in a green smoothie, and then it's a win-win-win all around. In fact, one of the comments on this book, uh, take it or leave it, some guy on Amazon wrote, I didn't realize how much this dude likes smoothies, and he apparently went through my book and counted that I used the word smoothie like 150 times. <laughs> so that's kind of comical, but it's in there nonetheless. I also have movies about wild edibles all over YouTube. I'm gonna put links to everything in this video. I have a video I recently published called Common Weeds and Wild Edibles of the World. It's free to watch and I highly recommend that you do so. And then lastly, I have 
over 10 ebooks about wild edibles on my website, sergeybutenko.com. And the premise of the ebooks, the reason for the ebooks, is really so that you can save them to your mobile device and take them wherever you go with you. Because we don't always have a field guide with us. Often we leave the house and we don't think to bring a book with us, but we always have a cell phone with us. So put the ebook on your cell phone and take it wherever you go, and then you'll know how to identify tasty, nutritious plants wherever you are. And finally, because I don't want to just promote my own products, there's lots of great books on foraging. I just want to give you a little sample of my absolute favorite books. And after that, I promise we're going to hop outside and start the walk. So one of my good friends and fellow foragers, John Kalis, he wrote an awesome book. It's called Wild Edible Plants, Wild Foods from Dirt to Plate. This is one of my foraging Bibles. I know this man personally. He puts out great stuff. The Queen of Wild Edibles wrote a book called Discovering Wild Plants. This is Janice Shawfield. And this book says Alaska, Western Canada, and the Northwest. But pay no mind, this book is good for pretty much everybody, especially if you live in Europe and North America. And as you can see by all my sticky notes, this book has been used, abused, and loved. So check this book out. Again, links will be in the description below. And I can't possibly make a wild edibles video without mentioning Samuel Thayer. Samuel Thayer is a super rad dude. All his books are awesome. I read and reread them all the time. They have a lot of great info. He's very thorough. Speaking of, if you want to learn the real story of what happened to the dude in Into the Wild, you should check out one of his books because he has a great account of it. And I believe that is in Nature's Garden. That account is either Nature's Garden or Forager's Harvest. So I fulfilled my obligations. I gave an intro. I told you that I'm credible. Now let's hop outside and look at some wild edibles. Okay, here's proof that I'm not cheating. I'm actually going out my front door. Let the foraging commence. Okay, so... Let me check the exposure just to make sure that it's on what we need it to be on because we want it to be nice and crystal clear. Okay, so the very first wild edible that I want to talk about is growing abundantly everywhere and that's known as grass. Most people probably don't consider grass as a food and rightfully so, it's not very delicious, but nonetheless, it's very nutritious. And in my book, it's kind of like a survival food. So most grass species are edible. And, you know, while you might, might not want to throw it in your salad because it's kind of hard to digest, you can easily make juice out of it or blend it in your green smoothies. Yes, the topic of smoothies is going to come up a lot. And this is probably also a very good point in time to mention that you want to be careful, obviously, when you go foraging. And one of the things that you want to be careful of is chemical sprays. So my yard is organic. I don't spray it with any kind of chemical fertilizers. And I recommend that you do the same. If you move to a place and you don't know whether or not it's been sprayed, I recommend waiting two years or at least a year and a half before you forage from the property that way you ensure that it's clean and that you stay safe so if i were to harvest grass for food i would literally come over here with a pair of scissors and i would just snip 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 into a little bowl or straight into my blender container and instead of buying wheat grass at the store i could get it get it for free I think most people, whether they're expert foragers or beginners, can identify grass with ease and it shouldn't be an issue. So see, this hasn't even been a couple minutes and you already know a wild edible. Okay, let's start over here. So as you can see, I have like a little planter box, which I made in another YouTube video. And you should watch that video too, because it's pretty good. I've planted some things, obviously, but that's not the topic of today. Today we're going to talk 
solely about wild edibles. The next plant that I want to discuss is this plant right here. And obviously this is a dandelion. This is the origin of lettuce. So all lettuces were once dandelions. And so if that isn't a giveaway that this thing is edible, I don't know what is. The dandelion is probably the most underappreciated wild plant. People think they're a nuisance, but they're extremely nutritious. In this video, I wanna kinda of keep it short and concise. I'm not gonna go into all of the nutritious benefits of wild edibles, because in researching my book, I discovered that wild plants are good for almost everything. I'm not even exaggerating. I actually have lists and charts in my book that cite all those health benefits and then tell you where I got that information. So I won't go in great detail about the health benefits because I want to talk about it from a purely free food standpoint. So maybe I will just note a couple of the major benefits and then if you're interested, you could reference my book or other books and figure out what they're good for. So dandelions are probably the best plant for your internal organs, your liver, your pancreas, your kidneys, that kind of thing. The only trouble is that they're a little bit bitter, right? And a great way to combat this bitterness is, yep, you guessed it, green smoothies. So when you blend greens with fruits together in a blender, it makes a very delicious cocktail and it neutralizes any bitterness or chlorophyll-like taste. So plop these in a blender and you're gonna be eating really good. Another thing I absolutely love doing with dandelion is putting the leaves in a pesto because another thing that neutralizes the bitter taste of the greens is fats. So if you blend this with some pine nuts, some olive oil, some cheese if you prefer, you can make a really nice dandelion pesto. It's gonna incorporate some of the wild food from your yard, it's gonna be free, it's gonna be novel, and most of all, and most importantly, it's gonna be delicious. So just throw some leaves, a couple handfuls, like, you know, the same proportion that you would use with basil. Just throw dandelions into your pesto and it's finger licking good. Another part that's very edible and very delicious is the flour. And the flour, I like to just throw in a salad. So basically come over here, you know, take any of the stem off, not because it's not edible, just because it's not as pleasant. And I throw the flowers in a salad and it tastes really good. Another great way to use the flowers is to put them in honey. You can literally make like a wild edibles jam by smushing a bunch of these flowers into a jar of honey, letting them sit there indefinitely because the sugar will preserve them. And then it makes like a nice vitamin D infused jam. And there's a common misconception that the sap, the white sap that comes from dandelions is bad. And that is complete BS. It's actually what's really good for your internal organs. That's where the bitter taste comes from. So you don't have to worry about that at all. You can eat the entire plant. And there's over 300 different varieties, all of which are edible. And then the last thing that I wanna say about these is that one key way to identify dandelions versus dandelion lookalikes is by their stem. So if you flip the leaf over and you run your finger along the main vein, you'll notice that dandelion stems are smooth. If the stem is not smooth, if it's prickly or spiky, then it's likely not a true dandelion, which doesn't mean that it's not edible, but it's definitely not a dandelion. So while we're here, I wanna digress a little bit and show you something that's kind of interesting to notice. So these are some nasturtiums that I planted. They're a domesticated plant. And it's been raining a lot this spring in Washington and you can see the plants getting over watered and it's not doing so hot. Same thing over here. If you come over to the basil, you see that, see it's getting kind of yellow. And that's the plant saying, sun, please come out. We need to dry out a little bit. On the flip side, when you look at the dandelions, they're doing just fine because they're survivors. And that's one of the key benefits of wild edibles is that their genetic makeup is the way that it was supposed to be. So they're genetically stronger as plants. They generally have longer root systems that enable them to draw out more vitamins and minerals from soil. 
and that's a good thing because they're more nutrient rich hence why I'm making this video and advocating more wild edible eating moving along we have some other stuff to look at on the side of the house let's start over here this right here is a type of thistle this right here is a thistle and thistles are a form of sunflowers so you know this looks kind of like an unfriendly angry plant because it has spines all over it but that's a protective mechanism of the plant and it's a perfectly edible plant if you know how to eat it so with thistles it helps to have something to cut it with you're gonna cut it at the base and you're gonna do so carefully it actually helps to have a glove but I have a lot of stuff going on so I can't be bothered and so the part that you eat is the inner stem so you carefully peel away the leaves of this thistle it's just a baby thistle it's not very tall yet but this inner part right here right here is the part that you eat so you go a little bit of work but it's well worth it this tastes kind of like mm, like something between a Jerusalem artichoke and a cucumber and as the thistle gets bigger this part gets bigger so you'll get a more bigger reward once this plant has matured perhaps this is a great point in time to talk about some very common sense guidelines these are like Sergei Butenko's safety rules. There's three main rules that you gotta follow. Rule number one, don't eat something if you don't know what it is. Super common sense. So common sense that I'm appalled when people disregard this rule. Plants can't hurt you unless you put them in your body. So as unfortunate as it is when people get hurt, you know, misforaging, they really have nobody to blame but themselves. So don't eat something if you don't know what it is. I made a silly rat video about it just to drive the point home. And I'm gonna link to that video in this video as well. So that's rule number one. Rule number two is treat all new plants with caution. So this thistle, for example, I tell you that it's edible, but you're gonna approach it very cautiously nonetheless because it's a new food to you and you don't know if your body's allergic to it, if it's gonna have any negative reactions. So start slowly. When you try a new food for the first time, just try a little bit and make sure that it affects your body positively. And rule number three builds on the first two rules and says you don't wanna to combine too many different plants into one recipe when you're just learning. So for example, if I'm a new forager, I don't wanna make a salad with 15 different wild edibles because if I do experience a negative reaction, I won't be able to weed out what caused the reaction. So don't eat something if you don't know what it is. Try all new foods in small quantities and don't mix wild edibles when you're learning new plants. From the thistle, we literally only have to walk three steps to the next plant. This is called peppercress. I'd like to introduce you to peppercress. It's this kind of small, unassuming plant. It's very delicate. And let's see if we can't learn to identify it. Okay, so it's got tiny little flowers and little leaves that look a little bit like arugula leaves. Peppercress is in the mustard family. And the easiest way to identify mustards is by the smell because all mustards smell like mustard. So if you see something that you think is peppercress, one sure way to figure out if it really is, is to crush up the leaves, give it a smell, and if it has a slightly peppery mustard-like flavor, then it's edible, because mustards are edible. John Kalis, the guy that I mentioned, one of the books that I showed you at the beginning, he believes that mustard greens are some of the most nutritious greens on the planet. They should be eaten every which way you can. So this stuff is really good in sandwiches and wraps. 
You can use it as a pot herb, you can throw it in soups. It's very delicious, and it has a little bit of kick to it, but like mustard, the kick doesn't last. So if you don't like super spicy cayenne pepper, but you like a little bit of spice that kind of passes quickly, this is for you. It's kind of like wasabi. Let's keep going. Boom, 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 boom. Into the backyard. So I guess we were in the front yard to start. All right, lots of stuff to look at here. Okay, check this out. This is gonna be cool. So this right here is clover. And clover is a pea relative. So essentially clovers are like pea sprouts, which means that they're really good in salads and soups. And they're very tender. Now, generally speaking, clovers have three leaves and the leaves are oval. This is a common misconception. In fact, when you Google clover, often you get images that are heart-shaped, and that's not clover. That's wood sorrel, which I think we have on the property as well. So remember that clover has three oval-shaped leaves. Often clovers also have this tiny little crescent shape, kind of a discoloration on the leaves, so that's a good identifying characteristic. And then I don't know if the camera will get this, but if you look really closely at the leaf of a clover, at the edges, if you look really closely, you'll notice that they're serrated. That's also a good identifying characteristic. Question, did you know that four leaf clovers are more nutritious than three leaf clovers? It's true. They're 25% more nutritious. Eh, yeah, get it? <laughs> so these are great, like I already mentioned, in salads, soups, wraps, definitely in smoothies. Why buy sprouts or even grow sprouts when they're already grown on your property? So there you go, wild peas, essentially. And look, right next to the clovers, we have more dandelions. Yum. Okay, so there were our clovers. And if we just literally move a couple feet, we have another plant that's worth mentioning. This is called sow thistle. Sow thistle. I'd like to introduce you to it. This is sort of like a dandelion. It's a little bit bitter to the taste, therefore it's good in pesto, smoothies. This one is ex exquisite in soups because it gets very tender. And you can see there's a lot of it. You know, if I were to buy this at the store, this is at least five bucks worth of greens. Right here I also want to teach you guys about Mary stems or meristematic bits. Samuel Thayer has a great chapter about meristems in his book, as do I. But meristematic parts are the tender, young, growing parts of plants. So you have the mature leaves, which tend to be more bitter, and then you have the meristematic, or young parts, that tend to be a lot sweeter. Think of like sweet snow peas versus mature green peas that can be kind of tough and fibrous. So one strategy as a forager, if you want to eat really good, is to pick out more of the baby greens because they're going to have more sugars, more carbohydrates, the good kind. People these days are trained to think that carbohydrates are awful, but they give you energy. They're essential. Don't forget to eat the good carbs. So, you know, these leaves are great, but these are going to be more nutritious and taste a lot better. So if you want to make a salad, maybe use those in a salad and then use those in a soup or a smoothie. Okay, so a few minutes ago we talked about clovers and how they have three round leaves. Here's a little refresher. Clovers, three round leaves. And this tiny little plant right here is wood sorrel. This is what clover often gets confused for. And unfortunately today they're not full grown. They're tiny babies, which I shouldn't say unfortunately because these are really delicious when they're in their baby green stage. But for camera purposes, you won't get to see that they're roughly, when they're fully grown, the same size as clovers, maybe a little bit bigger. And again, I just want to point out that clover leaves are oval and wood sorrel leaves are heart-shaped. So you have three oval leaves for the clover, three heart-shaped leaves for the wood sorrel. This is a really nice plant. 
It's lemony to the taste. I make a delicious trail side lemonade with this stuff, which is to say I just throw handfuls of this in my water. If I have ice handy, I throw some ice in it. And it's just kind of like a nice refreshing lemon water when there's no lemon water around. Actually here, look, I didn't look far enough. Here's a bigger wood sorrel. And you can kind of see from this that yeah, it's easy to, it would be easy to confuse these. But that's why we have eyes. That's why we have other senses, right? So these are the things that make you progress as a forager is just by very carefully, slowly studying plants and noticing their differences. And I always recommend that you don't try and tackle foraging all at once. Just learn one plant at a time. Maybe in this video, you just learn one new plant every time you watch it. So today you're gonna learn clover, then you're gonna learn wood sorrel. Just think about it this way. If you learn one plant a week for a year, you'll know 52 new plants by the end of the year. And one plant a week is very doable. Look at this abundance. This is an overgrown flower bed. And here you have two different types of dandelions. You have round leaf dandelions and you have more jagged leaf dandelions. Two different varieties, their micronutrients will differ. So when we talk about rotating your greens, I have another video about that, the importance of rotating your greens, which is what you're doing when you're eating different wild edibles. But you're getting, you're filling your body with different micronutrients just while staying within the same species. In addition to the dandelions, we have this plant, and I'm not quite sure I know what this is. I'm gonna have to reference this later. So I'm not gonna talk about it because I don't eat anything that I don't know what it is. We have more peppercress right there. This is a bigger plant. And you can see that you can just pull it up with the roots <laughs> because this is a weed. I'm not overly concerned with wiping it out. So I would literally take this home, just a few steps away, clean it and eat the entire thing. Another plant that's growing right here that's worth mentioning is a plant that's called cat's ears. And it looks very similar to dandelion, but wait. When you flip it over and you run your finger down the main vein, you feel that it's slightly fuzzy. So that's a good way to tell that it's a dandelion look-alike, but it's not a true dandelion. That being said, cat's ears are edible, though I tend to not like them as much because they are fuzzy. And that's not really a texture that I like, but that being said, you can still throw them in a soup, in a pinch, in a survival situation, cat's ears, totally edible. And then again, you have sow thistle right here. So just in this one little spot, there's tons of different food, tons of different food. And I almost missed this one. This is in the adjacent flower bed to the one that where I just was. This right here is wild radish. And wild radish is another mustard. See, there's actually like a little root that is the radish. But the greens are very nutritious. And because it's a mustard, when you crush this up, it'll smell like mustard. Yep, that's true. It smells like mustard. So mustards are edible and wild radish is definitely edible and it's delicious. Man, I tell you what, as soon as I hit the record button, planes start flying, people start sweet, street sweeping. It's, it's the real deal, dogs start barking. Look at this, we found some other stuff right here. Let's, ta-da, this is a type of wild mint. It has a very ominous name, it's called purple dead nettle which makes it sound like maybe you shouldn't eat it. But that's the trouble with common names, is they're not always favorable or accurate. We know it's a mint because mints all have square stems. And if you look at the stem very closely, you'll notice that it's just that, it's square. This doesn't really smell like mint, so you can't use your nose wherever it goes on all plants. But nonetheless, 
using your eyes and your touch. You can identify it by its square stem and know that it is indeed edible. I'll be honest, I'm not as big of a fan of this uh, purple dead nettle. I just don't think it tastes as good as the other plants, so I don't often eat this. But nonetheless, it's growing on my property, and we're here, so I thought, why not talk about it? Do 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 do, here we go, keep going. Oh look, we have common mallow. Yeah, this is a real treat right here. Common mallow, or malva, is in the okra family. And it's very delicious. This is, back in the day, David Wolf actually taught me about this plant. So, years ago, in 1997, I spent a week living with David Wolf. And one of the things we did is we foraged together and we rolled pieces of avocado in mallow leaves. And they're absolutely delicious. So you can eat this plant raw or put it in cooked food or or whatever, roll it in a burrito, put it on your pizza. And this is a sprawling plant, so it'll go across the ground. You know, come to think of it, maybe I should do a follow-up on this as these plants mature so that you can see them when they're easier to identify, because this is just early spring, and so some of these things are just now sprouting for the first time. Up a couple feet from the mallow, we have this guy. And this guy right here, this is yellow dock. And yellow dock is very rich in iron. So if you're iron deficient and you wanna eat this plant. But another thing that this thing is good for is bug bites and stings. So if you, if you ever get stung by a bee or an ant and it hurts, what you do is you chew this plant up or blend it up and then apply that poultice to your sting and it'll help remedy it instantly and take the pain off and the swelling off. This is also good for nettles rash so if you get stung by nettles hiking around look for dock. Big broad leaves kind of looks a little bit like maybe like spinach leaves but has a little bit more creases. I think we're getting close. We're, we're just about there, I think. Check it out, I have a bed with lettuce here, some peas in the corner. So this is my intentional crop. And then littered all over my property, I have unintentional food like this guy. In the front yard, back to the front yard, we have another green that's worth mentioning. This guy right here, look, there's Here's another green worth mentioning. This is called chickweed. And chickweed, every gardener should be familiar with chickweed. It's a tiny little tender green that has very, very little flowers. And at first glance, it looks like each flower has 10 petals, but they actually have five petals that are deeply cleft. So that's a key identifying characteristic of chickweed. Check this out. I'm not kidding. That's a big military jet. I'm sitting here recording and I kid you not, things just start flying, noise starts happening as soon as the camera rolls. <laughs> okay, back to the chickweed. So another key identifying characteristic of chickweed is that it has an alternating hairline on its stem. So if you look really closely, between each set of leaves, there's going to be a hairline and then further on down that hairline will jump 180 degrees to the opposite side of the stem. And so unfortunately, I don't think the camera with this lens will be able to pick it up, but maybe that's your homework. You gotta go find some chickweed, tiny white flowers with five petals that are deeply cleft, and study it and look for a hairline on its stem. This is a great green, it's very tender, good for salads, it's like a sprout and you can eat the entire plant, flowers and all. Okay, so here's another rule. Generally, you don't wanna harvest plants near a roadway because there could be runoff from the roadway. So my 
kind of safety rule about roads because roads are becoming more and more prevalent you can't avoid them altogether is that you want to distance yourself from the road you want to create as much distance from a busy intersection as you can I live on a res residential street so for me I'm not as much concerned but still I prefer to harvest up there versus down here on the curb. That being said, I'm gonna show you a plant that I found growing on the curb and nowhere else on the property. So I won't eat this one, but I wanna talk about it. Check it. This is called sheep sorrel right here. And this is another type of sorrel. You know that based off the other sorrel we talked about, the wood sorrel, that it's lemony to the taste. So this plant has leaves that look like a sword. I don't know if you can see that or not because it's bright out and my LCD screen is not too bright. But this plant is very tasty. You can use it in lemonades, that kind of thing. Use it in salads and wraps. This is a very good, fancy cuisine type of green. That rhymes, doesn't it? Sheep sorrel. And then the seeds are rich in omega-3s. So when I make crackers from time to time, I'll just sprinkle the seeds in like I would chia seeds or flax seeds or that kind of thing. So this is called sheep sorrel. Check it out. That's what abundance looks like. Free food that's very nutritious. You can make it delicious. That's what I'm all about. So there you have it. See, just like that. It's quite good. That's a tour of my backyard, a foraging tour. I hope you've learned a couple things and found this video to be helpful. For more videos just like this that are totally different, remember to subscribe to my channel, Butenko Films. Subscribing these days doesn't really mean much, so if you want to be notified of a new video, hit the little bell and you'll get a notification. Alright, peace!